Um, as you see, um, this sentence, I don't take no stock in dead people, um, which you may have seen before, early in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, could also have been in its prequel, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. For just a moment, I want to think about the implications of this familiar but ambiguous statement. I googled it. I was thinking there's got to be some critical essay out there that I've never heard of, looking for its role in pedagogical practice, and was amused, if disheartened, to discover that the top result is part of a multiple choice exam for ESL students. Lord help them. Here are the choices that follow the question, what does Huck mean by his expression that he doesn't take no stock in dead people? One, he finds it unpleasant to talk about them. Two, he finds them uninteresting because they're dead and gone. Three, he's not sure if they even ever existed. Four, he forgets everything about them because he doesn't like history. Choose. <laughs> they're all right. <clears throat> These I, I never could have passed this quiz. <laughs> These questions resonate with teaching American history in a number of states right now. The not at all amusing result for me is that in my opinion, all of the answers are correct. A reminder of the importance of teaching ambiguity to our students. To take stock in dead people is also, this is a Halloween talk, I gotta admit. To take stock in dead people is also to figure out how to monetize their existence, something that historians do as a matter of course. In the novels by Mark Twain, the taking stock veers in and out of comedy and tragedy. The many dead bodies in Huckleberry Finn might be anticipated by the deaths in Tom Sawyer, beginning with the grim after effect of digging up a dead body for dissection. Unlike Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer speaks but does not appear as a narrator. The narrator uses conventional, if spooky, language to describe an early location visited by Huck and Tom. This adventure begins when Tom Sawyer leaves his home in the middle of the night. Huckleberry Finn was there with his dead cat. I wasn't counting the number of dead cats, but there we are. <laughs> the deaths are about to proliferate. It was a graveyard of the old fashioned Western kind with a crazy board fence around it, which leaned inward in places and outward the rest of the time, but stood upright nowhere. All the old graves were sunken in. There was not a tombstone on the place. Round-topped, worm-eaten boards staggered over the graves, leaning for support and finding none. The atmosphere established here includes forms of anthropomorphism as the fence leans and the wooden boards that stand in for tombstones stagger. The very breathlessness of the narrative voice as it stumbles over these details sets the mood. A faint wind moaned through the trees, and Tom feared it might be the spirits of the dead complaining of being disturbed. The boys talked little and only under their breath, for the time and the place and the pervading solemnity and silence oppressed their spirits. They ensconced themselves within the protection of three great elms that grew in a bunch within a few feet of the grave. Then they waited in silence for what seemed a long time. The hooting of a distant owl was all the sound that troubled the dead stillness. Tom's reflections grew oppressive. He must force some talk, so he said in a whisper, Huck, do you believe the dead people like it for us to be here? Huckleberry whispered, I wished I knowed. What they're about to witness is murder among the graves. You might not remember that the victim of the murder is a doctor seeking to dis disinter a hanged man for dissection, a fairly common move for doctors in the 19th century. The murderer is the so-called Injun Joe, a figure who preoccupies Carrie Driscoll in her wonderfully detailed book, Mark Twain Among the Indians and Other Indigenous Peoples. Um, and as I was saying to Joe, they did a podcast um, about her work recently. Actually, I think, yeah, anyway, I recommend it. Later in the novel, this murderer will meet a wretched death, starving after being locked up in a cave that apparently persists as a tourist attraction in the actual Hannibal, Missouri. But before that happens, the two boys head out on the Mississippi. The raft drew beyond the middle of the river. The boys pointed her head right and then lay on their oars. Now the raft was passing before the distant town. Two or three glimmering lights 
showed where it lay peacefully sleeping beyond the vague, vast sweep of star-gemmed water, unconscious of the tremendous event that was happening. The language here, definitely reminiscent of the language of the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, but the adventure is shorter, and that is only part of what makes Tom Sawyer a safer participant on elementary school library shelves. Arguably, as Carrie Driscoll so ably shows, it's the invisible racism of blaming the Indian that continues to make this book seem a neutral exposure of the fear of death for a child along the Mississippi River in the 19th century. I'm going to detour, for fun, um, with a look at the pleasant memory. And, and again, part of the subtext here is how much people want to remember that Tom Sawyer is a boy's book. And, and indeed, they want to remember this about Huckleberry Finn as well, that there's this pleasure, this happiness. Um, and, and a lot of that happiness is associated with the paintings of Caleb Bingham, who um, often his paintings get used for the covers of Huckleberry Finn, for example, the, the paperback versions. It's, a, it's an appropriation that's both, as I'm stating, useful and fun. And I'm not going to read all of the captions that I put up here, but I encourage you to think about it for a minute. In what way do these paintings set up a sense of the pleasure of the river that visually melds with why we, we, and I say we, I'm sorry if I'm including you, keep thinking about the pleasure of being on the river and not the danger. Um, so I put these here for fun. The joy that emerges on the raft, the sequence of paintings gets suggests how readers want to encounter Mark Twain. Men on the river find pleasure in going down downstream, but I'm, I'm encouraging you to imagine that this is a retelling, a historical romance. The mostly familiar paintings show men who are posing, not the men who would have been on the raft. That is, in their way, they have been whitewashed, like the fence in Tom Sawyer. The men who sold wood off rafts to steamboats um, which is part of what is being depicted here, would have been covered in dirt and would have been racially mixed, which these paintings are not. Further, even as Twain's novels invoke the phrase sold down the river as a horror, the pastoral ideal of Bingham's paintings produced when there were bodies for sale on the river suggests simply that also sold on the river were the logs of wood to keep the steamboats moving. This talk revisits both familiar and unfamiliar stories about men on the river. What draws them to the water shifts with the author. For Mark Twain, the Mississippi River becomes a recursive site of memory and loss, even as he repeatedly evades the stories of war that traverse it. For Herman Melville, which I'll turn to later, the transformation enabled by a confidence man, transformations become at once bitter satire and a ferocious form of rootlessness that engages the violence on the banks of the river. Both Twain and Melville address a famously precarious river that runs to the sea. The sea, or more precisely, the Gulf of Mexico, waits for that river and the humans that ride on it to arrive. That arrival might be anticipated but does not appear in their tales. At once a place and repeatedly placeless, the watery landscapes of the river and the sea reveal bodies in motion. The travelers and the forms of migrant labor on board shift with waves of immigrants. That is, the geographical placing in such fiction leads to a placelessness as bodies are moved through watery landscapes. The Mississippi River threads through, proposing its own form of crossing from freedom to slavery. Historians have unpacked the sinister aspect of the Mississippi River as a conduit for what has been called the Second Middle Passage. It has been estimated that between 1800 and 1860, at least 875,000 American slaves were forcibly removed from the Upper South to the Lower South by means of the Mississippi. The mixed feelings that Mark Twain has as he returns on board a steamboat to rehearse his years as a pilot in life on the Mississippi remain off balance. He remembers and forgets at once that the journey to New Orleans repetitively enacts the trade in human bodies. The forced displacement, illness, and genocide of the Atlantic crossing appears condensed on board a ship on the Mississippi. As we will see in a work such as Melville's earlier, The Confidence Man, the oral traditions and trickster narratives that are cultural survival from West Africa keep all listeners off balance. 
And this is um, just for fun to kind of get us into the additions that I think Elmira College has. Mm -hmm. um, and to think about what's going on as the repeated version of thinking about Tom Sawyer is the whitewash fence, the deception of appearing at your own funeral, which also appears in the novel, tends to vanish. Um, and the first person voice of Huck Finn that appears right, in, right initially as a kind of transition that I'm going to talk about is a playful address to readers about what it is to have a narrator, an author, and a reader. So that Huck Finn um, says initially, and this is a quick glimpse of the first page, you don't know about me without you've read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, this kind of playful enacting of a pseudonym, Mr. Mark Twain, underneath the guise of truth from this narrator who says he told the truth mainly. And now, I'm turning to Life on the Mississippi, which he, Twain was working on Huck Finn when he wrote Life on the Mississippi, and that's part of what I'm going to talk about. Mark Twain began his career finding a name in the measurement of water. His nostalgic account of his career as a pilot begins with an inscribed trade mark, and this is the copyright page to Life on the Mississippi. A typographically complicated enactment of the two names appears so that the first line reads by S.L. Clemens. That name stands without explanation over the smaller type produced in all capital letters, Mark Twain. Both names, and I guess I could do this little thing where you get to notice how these things are set up here. Both names are enclosed by a large parenthesis and to the left of the parenthetical frame placed vertically is the word trade while to the right also placed vertically is the name is the word mark. This enactment of overlapping claims to a name to property and to experiments in typography re-inhabits the claim to the name mark as part of a gesture of property ownership as well as to the classic story of claiming the name because of the announcement by riverboat captains on the Mississippi that they mark Twain, that is, two fathoms of depth between the boat and the bottom of the river. The man who marks himself as Twain marks himself twice before leaving his mark on the page. The deception continues further into the text as the preface appears, inserting other voices alongside his own without always determining the privileges of trademark. Twain cites these words as from the editor's table, Harper's Magazine. The title of the editorial is The Body of the Nation, and it begins, but the basin of the Mississippi is the body of the nation. These typographical emphases are in the original, but they mimic the typographical emphases in the trademark statement on the copyright page. The peculiarity of the emphasis on water as a body is extended as the remarks continue as to statistical comparisons with Europe, and I won't I have more stuff on this, but I'm going to skip over some of it. The excerpt from the testimonial ends with a tribute to the United States and the river alike. As a dwelling place for civilized man, it is by far the first upon our globe. Even as one might imagine that these remarks refer to the fertility of the Mississippi River Valley, the ambiguity of the word it leads us to a superficial reading that understands that humans live upon the water and indeed the watery space of the river. And since the title of Twain's book, Life on the Mississippi, as well as the biographical details feature his existence as a river pilot, something might be said for imagining the book as a guide for how to live on the water. The earliest white people transporting goods and humans on the river engaged in journeys from St. Louis to New Orleans and back that could take nine months. A reader accustomed to other stories of transporting bodies on the river, especially a reader thinking of the stories that dominate Huckleberry Finn and Puddinghead Wilson, will find barely a mention of the transport of people held as slaves. The topic does not seem to concern Twain. Instead, he describes humans on those barges as laborers, and indeed this is like the Caleb Bingham paintings, hordes of rough and hardy men, rude, uneducated, brave, suffering terrible hardships. Nostalgia enters the account early as Twain engages the memories that will feed the stories he later tells, remembering the annual processions of mighty rafts that used to glide by Hannibal when I was a boy. The rafts trigger a story. 
Twain explains that he will throw in, in this place, a chapter from a story which details some passages in the life of an ignorant village boy, Huck Finn, son of the town drunkard. And this is the, the kind of first appearance in print. As the boy runs away, with him a slave of the widows has also escaped. They are bound for Cairo, and if you didn't know, in Illinois it's called Cairo. Whence the Negro will seek freedom in the heart of the free states, but in a fog they pass by Cairo without knowing it. Twain includes an adventure of boarding a strange raft with words from Huckleberry Finn. But you know a young person can't wait very well when he is impatient to find a thing out. This early draft, and, and I shouldn't assume that you remember that in Huckleberry Finn there's this key moment when they think they're looking for the clear water of the Ohio River and then they'll go, go up the Ohio and escape to freedom and instead there's a storm. So this early draft of the crucial wrong turn on the river that drives much of the action for Huckleberry Finn contains several changes. A disturbing difference from the novel appears with a strange tale of being followed by a haunted barrel that contains a dead baby that one of the men has killed. Of course, this is not in Huckleberry Finn. Such a dead baby never appears in Huckleberry Finn, but perhaps the ghosts of murdered children pursue Huck down the river. And that, that again, is the Halloween aspect of my talk, which is to think about ghosts and to think about the corpses that in certain ways chase after the raft going down the river. The traces of morbid terror suggest that gestures of humor at humor inadequately cover for how much the entire narrative is haunted by the bodies discarded in the water. Also omitted from the virgin version, and this is, I do have a, I do have a slide which I wasn't planning to show, but if you want me to, I can show it later. Um, there's a, a very humorous uh, and also graphically depicted anecdote um, which shows men discovering Huck's naked body crouched in the darkness on the raft this is the quote, I was warm and soft and naked. So he says, ouch, and jump back. Um, escaping from the potential consequences of this suggestive discovery, Huck reaches the small raft that he shares with Jim. I swum out and got aboard and was mighty glad to see home again. Now remember, this is in Life on the Mississippi, not in Huckleberry Finn. What the home on the raft has become in this rendering is a place away from killers. In the revision Twain makes in developing the plot of the novel, incorporating a sometimes evasive agency, Huck becomes the killer. After this interlude, Twain returns to talking about viewing boats in his childhood, long and sharp and trim and pretty. And cresting such boats is a place of glory for a young boy, a fanciful pilot house, all glass and gingerbread, perched on the top of the Texas deck. The other accoutrement of the boat seemed fenced in like a yard afloat. The boiler deck, the hurricane deck, and the Texas deck are fenced and ornamented with clean white railings. Longing to work on such a boat, by and by I ran away. I said I would never come home again till I was a pilot. The desire takes him to New Orleans with a dream of joining an expedition up the Amazon River. Again, we don't quite remember this about <laughs> Mark Twain. Inspired by the popular tales of travelers, he proclaims, I would go and complete the exploration of the Amazon. That was all the thought I gave to the subject. I never was great in matters of detail. The earlier dream of exploring South America gives way to a repeated cycling up and down the path of the river. The main pleasure of his travel sometimes seems to be an education in the language of the men on board, language that he carefully edits for print with asterisks, surely when he gave it orally, he took out the asterisks. The desire to have this language in his mouth enhances his desire to live on the river. The young twain strikes a bargain with Mr. Bixby, the pilot of the Paul Jones, by which he will return upriver to St. Louis and learn how to be a pilot in exchange for the first $500 he, he earns. He follows this pilot onto an even larger boat at St. Louis. The pilot house here is a sumptuous glass temple. As a student, twain learns how to read the surface of the water the face of the water in time, he says, became a wonderful book. To extend the metaphor, Twain explains that a ripple on the face of the water is an italicized passage that the pilot must take note of as a legend of the largest capitals. And again, using typographical language to explain liquids. Even as he celebrates the difficult achievement in learning the face of the river, Twain mourns that his knowledge has subtracted poetry. 
He complains, I had lost something which could never be restored to me while I lived. All the grace, the beauty, the poetry had gone out of the majestic river. To see the river only in terms of safety and danger reminds Twain of what a doctor sees in the flesh on a human cheek, not beauty, but a symptom of disease. The desire to memorize the face of the water like a book merges with a book that feels like the shape of the water, changing the banks of the river, changing the mind of the reader. The disruption to trade on the river becomes practically the only historical acknowledgement the book indulges. After Twain manages to become a pilot, he tells his readers, the war came, commerce was suspended, my occupation was gone. He does not mention that after losing his occupation as a pilot, he fought briefly for the Confederate cause before he became over 21 years um, this is again his language, a silver miner in Nevada, a reporter, and finally, I became a scribbler of books. The same river that made it possible to travel from north to south has become a war zone. After two decades past the violence of Reconstruction, he returns to the Mississippi under an assumed name, but the pseudonym does not last. The first time he steps into a pilot house, Twain finds himself not only unmasked, but invited to steer the boat. I have been itching to get my hands on the wheel. Only late in the book does Twain turn to memories of the unnamed war. The story that he tells seems influenced by the boat's physical entry into the location of past battles, almost forcing Twain to comment. He says, talk began to run upon the war now, for we were getting down into the upper edge of the former battle stretch by this time. But no trace appears of Twain's war experience. The boundary markers between Union and Confederate states seem to exist in the same blur that the river produces on other boundaries as it floods farms and state lines alike. On July 4th, 1863, the Union Army captured Vicksburg and the Mississippi River was controlled by the North. That detail does not appear here. Instead, he returns to the other form of pseudonym that dominates the book, that of a tourist. The war has taken place both on and at the edge of the river, but it does not quite seem as visible as stories of villainy. For instance, Twain briefly mentions a galvanizing event, the Fort Pillow Massacre, that saw Confederate troops slaughter Union soldiers because of the color of their skin. Although Mr. Bixby has been head pilot of the Union fleet, his possibly heroic relation to warfare also does not appear. The story does turn to the recent killing of the outlaw Jesse James. Twain proposes that James was overshadowed by the marauding criminal he calls Morell, no, notorious for crimes associated with race. The most villainous act copied into the narrative from a now forgotten book, and, and there, is, there are elements of plagiarism in life in Mississippi, is that Morell swindled people held as slaves. They were encouraged to run away and then coldly sold or murdered as the gang fancied, and it's uncomfortable but provocative to think about how this also um, informs like the Duke. Um, in Huckleberry Finn. The stories excerpted are stunningly gruesome. They involve repeated casual slaughter and disemboweling with corpses dropped into Arkansas streams and swamps. Sometimes spelled Morell, the pilot, the pirate, John Morell, involved himself in the grim history of a gang called the Mystic Confederacy that sought to incite revolt for those held as slaves in order to steal them. The presidential John, candidate John Fremont again, 19th century, of course, was quoted as saying that during the war, whoever controlled the river would hold the country by the heart. The metaphors offer a contorted eloquence, as though to hold the heart of the nation was also to hold its spine. For Abraham Lincoln, it seems significant that he was, in 1828, traveling down the Mississippi on a raft to sell goods in New Orleans, returning by steamboat. In 1854, the Transcontinental Railroad first reached the river. The newspapers called it a marriage, the nuptial feast of the great Atlantic Ocean to the mighty father of waters. One historian comments, the coming of the railroad, and, and again, I, I know I'm doing a lot in a way, it'd be a lot easier if I put up a map, but I'm just imagining, asking you to imagine the continent that we're on and the Mississippi River traversing it. Okay. One historian comments, the coming of the railroad oriented the country to two metal tracks running from east to west. That shift from the north-south spine of the river to the east-west tracks of the railroad became ideological as well as commercial. 
The bridge across the Mississippi for the railroad that was completed in 1856 drew the wrath of the steamboat men and the fire that burned it down resulted in a legal battle during which Abraham Lincoln was hired as a lawyer. Lincoln's arguments in support of the railroad included the assertion that the railroad's desire to move traffic involved a more absolute fact. This is Lincoln. There is a travel from east to west whose demands are not less than those of the river. And again, that, that sense of a tension and a pulling of these two directions. The equivalence, the spatializing that Lincoln draws on invokes the competition that the railroad provided. The idea of the river as the spine of the country places the head in the north and the belly in the south. The confusion caused by crossing that spine is the writing of a commercial story across the romance of the river. The confusion of references that Twain includes suggests the unreliable narrator aboard the Mississippi in Melville's The Confidence Man, published the year after the bridge across the Mississippi was burned on April Fool's Day, 1857. The chapter called The Professor's Yarn contains stories reminiscent of Melville's and depicts a boat headed for California with gamblers aboard. In both works, a sort of Horatio Alger-inspired version of success appears as a function and even goal for the migratory aspects of the river. The elusive deceptions that the river affords engage fantasies of middle-class life, while the life on the banks repeatedly beckons as full of danger. The river runs south toward memories of slavery and war. Even though there's an element of the picturesque in these watery landscapes, their presence invariably invokes danger. The possibility of crossing water, especially water crossings that change affiliation and introduce violence, and it's important to remember, which of course a lot of Twain's novels remind us, but it's also easy to forget, that the river is often, especially in the north, in between places where slavery is legal and places where it is at least technically not. Uh, the possibility of crossing water, especially water crossings that change affiliation and introduce violence, return us to that troubling matter of what bodies on the water being carried as property. The autobiography that has become known as the story of Black Hawk, for example, contains many crossings of the Mississippi for violent raids or in retreat from violence. To read the face of the river is to read the faces of men on the river in his account as in others to anticipate whether they bring violence. To note what effect travel on the river has on the observation of human nature is to note what the stories that Herman Melville tells of life on the river might have in common with the nostalgia and the peril on the river visited by the man who marked himself as sounding the river's unstable depths as Mark Twain. Break. The lightness of men on the water, a lightness once associated with the world of Huckleberry Finn, finds a sinister formulation in Herman Melville's earlier The Confidence Man, one of Melville's most impenetrable novels. It's his last, so it's after Moby Dick and Pierre and all the other popular uh, sea novels. One of Melville's most impenetrable novels, both because the main character is a chameleon and because the humor is almost invariably sinister. Since the action takes place on the Mississippi, what makes the fluid nature of the space being inhabited a prime territory for the confidence man? As the central character, a man whose name can never be finally determined, just to, I'm, I, has anybody here read it? Yeah, okay, you, Matt, you don't get to raise your hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm assuming you haven't read it. I'm not gonna actually explain it because it cannot be explained. And Matt will agree with me. Ask, ask him. Um, you can read my article. <laughs> yeah, totally. I'll have you come up and explain it after this. Um, as the central character, a man whose name can never be finally determined, changes disguises, changes races, changes occupation and class standing, and never seems to occur to him to dress as a woman. That's just for the fun of it. Each character who appears so elaborately dressed prepares the stage for the appearance of the next character, proposing the credibility of the person to be duped as a matter that relies on belief in the next one to appear, the one who will vouch for the appearance of the first one, or who will have the means to swindle the person whose greed will have been awakened by the assurance that the next man to appear will have the bank stock or the patent medicine that he might invest in or purchase. Of course, these two are never on stage at the same time since they enable versions of each other. The narrator invites readers to marvel at the multiple ways in which the term confidence might be applied 
and the sheer absurdity appeals to, of appeals to charity and to forms of insubstantial investment that travelers in transit to and from unknown points along a 1,200 mile stretch of river might be drawn. And there's some other work that's been done on the instability of uh, currency at this, at this particular point and that how much the confidence man as a novel is drawing on the popularity of understanding that con men were everywhere trading pieces of paper. The man who appears in the first pages is pale and dressed in cream colors with flaxen hair and a white fur hat. This pale man, dressed in off-white garb, finds a boat where one peddler sells money belts and another sells pamphlets, retelling the stories of bandits, such as Morel, the pirate of the Mississippi, a return engagement of the bandit mentioned by Twain. These pirates, the story tells us, have been exterminated, and the reader's enthusiasm at hearing such good news might be tempered by the thought that Quote, in new countries where the wolves are killed off, the foxes increase. These stories immediately suggest that to enter the boat is to enter a place where predators are looking for prey. The stranger who enters up the boat holds up a slate and writes on it in chalk a series of biblical pronouncements, all beginning with the word charity. The word charity, we are told, is not erased from the board, even as a tumult of pressing bodies appears because the crowd that surrounds him has gathered to read the details of a notice posted on board the ship to watch out for swindlers, they push him out of the way. Um, I didn't bring my, my phone up here. How are we doing for time? Uh, 7.36. Okay. A few more minutes. As the Fidel passes down the river, the slow procession of humans is compared by Melville to Chaucer's Canterbury Pilgrims. That the ship's name suggests fidelity is already an irony reminiscent of the name, name of the ship, The Bachelor's Delight, in Benita Sereno. These pa pass passengers, we are told, have no lack of variety. This description seems designed to encourage the reader at once to look for distinction among them and to accept the concept of the stereotype that pervades their very distinctiveness. The narrator finds many men, again, it's a quote, I'm not gonna read all of it, men of business and men of pleasure, parlor men and backwoods men, farm hunters and fame hunters, heiress hunters, gold hunters, buffalo hunters, bee hunters, happiness hunters, truth hunters, and still keener hunters after all these hunters. The last item on this list betrays the invisible hunter on board. Mingled in almost without further notice are slaves, black, mulatta, quadroon, modish young Spanish creoles, and old-fashioned French Jews, grinning Negroes, and Sioux chiefs, hot, solemn as high priests. Melville declares this in a famous quote, a piebald parliament and an anacarsis clutes congress of all kinds of that multiform pilgrim series man, species, man. The coded variety of the crowd invites the readers to interpret humans according to their dress, skin, and ethnicity, even as the plot of the book enforces the idea that any such interpretation will be misleading. The following chapter's title, in which a variety of characters appear, highlights a transformation where the former whiteness of the confidence man utterly changes into an appearance as a grotesque Negro cripple who shuffles around the crowd with his honest black face, rubbing against the upper part of people's thighs. That is, of course, a quote. That position makes a good posture for robbing pockets. What he does after the narrator compares him to a Newfoundland dog, reminding the astute reader of the duplicitous babo in Benito Sereno, is to lift his head and catch pennies thrown from the crowd and very much the posture of a dog. As he throws back his head, the cripple's mouth being both target and purse, he swallows his emotions, but not the pennies. The strange suggestiveness of a face that rubs against the upper part of people's thighs, performing a kind of clothed fellatio, suggests the familiarity of the crowd with a man in a position of such subservience. The gesture of the open mouth resembles the posture of the metal jockeys once stationed outside southern homes to hold the reins of horses, and the posture of the human who assumes such a position becomes indistinguishable from such an object. When challenged, the man asks for confidence. That is, he's confronted. He sends for specifically de described witnesses to his identity. One person says that there's something queer about this darky. Depend on it. What can a person depend on? 
The queer appearance that he presents might, a reader later realizes, both be that he cannot be seen and that he will never be seen again, swallowed up by the river. And his speech, con concealing its significance through dialect, proposes the set of, di of disguises to follow, referring to ever so many good, kind, honest, gemin aboard, what knows me and will speak for me. The men who speak for this first instantiation of an investment in confidence will all walk away with money from their auditors. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of paragraphs. As he explains, the, the part of the challenge is to find out about how charity and confidence both work. As he explains the concept of the world's charity, the transformation in charitable donations will involve the present system of voluntary and promiscuous contribution to be done away with as a means of producing the Wall Street spirit in benevolence. The follow through would be conversion. The conversion of the heathen would be let out on contract. Sounds awfully familiar to things going on now, but I'll leave that aside. So much by bid for converting India, so much for Borneo, so much for Africa. The question of scale necessitates that he will be sending 10,000 missionaries in a body and converting China en masse. Benevolence as a motif tends to be productive of much danger in Melville. It has recently appeared in the uneasy benevolence in the novel Pierre that he wrote just before this, where whether to rescue his sister or out of a desire for a sister, Pierre seeks to bring her in relation to with the woman he was going to marry. It shows up in the misplaced benevolence of Benito Serena, where Captain Amasa Delano's misreading of events on board ship actually saves his life. The frustrated desire that the merchant expresses for the exercise of benevolence in Bartleby the Scrivener seems rather to encourage its fatal ending. Um, again, I'm going to skip a paragraph. Earlier in The Confidence Man, the mysterious stranger suggests that a gullible young college student might like to invest in the New Jerusalem a new and thriving city, so-called, in northern Minnesota. It was originally founded by certain fugitive Mormons and stands on the Mississippi. Notwithstanding the ambiguous status of a city that stands on water, the place has a map. The map has public buildings and 20 asterisks for the lyceums. The student is suspicious enough to ask if there are, these are water lots, and the stranger returns, and water lots is the idea that, in fact, You've marked out territory, but it's only water. The stranger returns water lots in the city of New Jerusalem, all terra firma. The firmness of this earth is not a byproduct of its relation to water, but rather that it has been founded on air. A new man says to a wary auditor, if you were other than I have confidence you are, hardly would you challenge distrust that way. Such a challenge raises the stakes for the philosophical intelligence officer that the confidence man seems to have become. Late in the book arises the metaphysics of Indian hating. Here the theme of the man in the woods crosses with the man on the river. To really witness conflicts about men on the Mississippi River is to mention major clashes along the river such as, a bit later, the Dakota Wars, that is slightly later than the writing of this novel, or before the writing of this novel, the story of Black Hawk. The multiple evasions that appear in The Confidence Man overlap with refusals to tell these stories except as stories that take place in the woods. Hence, that exposes how the explanation of the history of the river told by both Twain and Melville become interrupted. The story told about the river incorporates, on the one hand, Indian <coughs> hating, and on the other, the retellings of Indian legend that Melville relocates from the presentations of Judge Hall. The multicolored man that appears in another evasion of identity specificity is a man who subsumes racial en envy and benevolence at once. When the metaphysics of Indian hating appears, the words are attributed to my father's friend, Judge Hall, and we are told that the judge always began in these words. To follow the money as a strategy for interpretation works more effectively than following disguises in this book. Whenever money appears, the direction that it takes almost as liquid as water flowing south on the Mississippi River, is the direction of the confidence man. Whatever person the, river see, the reader sees in pursuit of money has the same identity. The color of green takes over from racial and class distinctions. The ambiguity of place on the river and the ambiguity of the name of the confidence man merge. That person in disguise 
is always the same, the person who takes money and fakes identification. The narrator presents a meditation on the idea of an original character in a work of fiction. Every great town is a kind of man's show. The occasions of stopping by towns along the river allow new characters to appear who can be swindled. They also interrupt the violence taking place on shore. Um, I have two more pages, and I might just summarize them and then turn to the last page. Um, I'll read two paragraphs. Rivers lead out to the sea, and one version of what Mark Twain imagined he would do when he traveled down the Mississippi River and reached New Orleans was to take a boat to Brazil and look not for the Mississippi, not for the Amazon River, as he explains it on life on the, in Life on the Mississippi, but rather for the possibility of a trade in cocaine. That was, of course, legal, as was the slave trade, which might have taken more men to see than did the hunt for whales that Melville celebrated in Moby Dick. Um, and part of what I'm skipping here is an account that a woman wrote about the Mississippi River, an account that I find really fascinating. This is how she ends it. Her name is Cora Montgomery, and she's writing in the United States Magazine and Democratic Review, which was a uh, gangbuster promo journal in the 19th century. In noting where benevolence finds its mark, the author protests that our Indian policy is a blot on the very name of Christianity. Yet what senator or what general proposes any change, except perhaps something a little more veiled and indirect in our inexorable system of despoilment and extermination. The bitterness with which Cora Montgomery imagines the clash of civilization that the river represents becomes a way to compl complete the vision of landscapes that the Mississippi divides as it clefts a space between free and slave territories on its journey south. To move against the current and trace the river on a journey to the north is to revisit the source of national landscapes, a place neither to the west nor to the east, neither slave nor free, but nonetheless compromised as the land of dispossession. I'm going to, I'm going to, I have one more paragraph, but I'm going to actually stop because I want to show you one more image, which is, um, again, I had a couple more things from Life on the Mississippi. He wrote this book here, Pori Farm, and throw in this image of Black Hawk. Um, I actually have, in another version of this uh, PowerPoint, a statue that has been erected to Black, Talk, Black Hawk, um, but he was a strong leader of an attempt to drive out white people along the Mississippi in a war that became known as the Black Hawk War, and again, a war in which Abraham Lincoln actually served his only military service. And this is from an account of um, remembering Black Hawk. All this part of the river is rich in Indian history and traditions. Black Hawks was once a strong name hereabouts. A few miles below is the Tête de Mort, Death's Head Rock or Bluff, to the top of which the French drove a band of Indians in early times and cooked them up there with death for a certainty and only the manner of it, matter of choice, to starve or jump off and kill themselves. And Part of the reason I'm stopping, I and mean, I, I have a concluding paragraph, but I'd rather in a way start, stop with this question that I would like to bring out for you. For me, the Mississippi River was long, as, as indeed you see me talking about in this talk, um, strong as a question about this really sad version of the Second Middle Passage, which is the threat of being sold down the river which shows up in a lot of Twain's fiction, which shows up in a lot of nonfiction, um, has uncomfortably for me become situated in relation to stories like the story of Black Hawk, or further north and in 1862 during the Civil War, the Dakota Wars. The question about in what way are there people crossing the river even as this business of being sold down the river is a legal form of the traffic in bodies. So I'm going to stop with that because I would like you to think of questions to ask me.